I hope to try to come to some conclusions in this, in this brief speech. Of course, for Greece, maybe helpful in comparing some of uh, what we've done with what you have done in this adjustment, this difficult adjustment process, but also uh, to talk about some of the wider European issues. And um, of course, Europe is, is facing um, a, a new tragedy recently with this Paris, uh, Paris terrorist act. We all are in solidarity with um, those that have victims and of course the, the French people and those living in France. And um, of course, uh, Greece is also at the forefront of the refugee crisis, which is uh, another big issue uh, that has uh, been um, uh, occupying the discussions of where Europe is going and the future identity of Europe. Uh, are these issues and the financial crisis linked? Well, maybe not directly, but indirectly the European response, I think I would like to at some point say what I think has been lacking. And in that way, they are, there is an indirect link, but I'll get to that. When I was elected in 2009, uh, I immediately realized that um, the previous government had not been telling the exact truth about the deficit. Uh, they had reported to Brussels that uh, it was 6.5%. I realized uh, after my finance minister informed me that it was upwards of 12.5%. 5%, almost more than double, and in the end it ended up 15.6%. Uh, I decided to be very open, very honest. Uh, Euripides uses the word very often in his plays, a Greek word which is parisia or parisia, which means um, not only the right to speak the truth and freely, but also the obligation to speak out uh, and tell the truth even at your life's own risk. So I did know in, um, in deciding to be very open about our problems that uh, there was a political risk, but I did feel that this was the only way we would be able to create a momentum for change in Greece because in the end, the deficit which we had was not simply by overspending, it was uh, a deeper structural problem of Greek governance, governance in Greece. As Brendan was saying earlier, the need that we actually complete uh, a process of becoming a modern functioning democracy. Uh, and I say that because, uh, and this I think uh, is in contrast with uh, even though your difficult history also, but we have uh, in the previous century gone through um, two world wars, uh, Nazi occupation and a famine at the time, two civil wars, Balkan wars, uh, uh, dictatorship in the 60s and the 70s, uh, a war uh, with Turkey over Cyprus, uh, now northern part being occupied by Turkey continually. So uh, Greece's history uh, is, a, is a one of, of, uh, of a state which was went through many uh, authoritarian and, and critical uh, stages, where only seven years after the dictatorship, six, seven years after the dictatorship, Giscard d'Estaing very much um, uh, in favor of the birthplace of democracy helped the then Karamalis, Prime Minister of Greece, uh, become a member of the European common market then. However, we did not, as other countries uh, in later enlargements, such as the ones in Central and Eastern Europe, we did not really have any prerequisites such as the so-called Copenhagen criteria. As a matter of fact, possibly because we were on the winning side of the Cold War, uh, it was seen that it was uh, very logical that Greece would just go in without major reforms of its structures. So, how the state was run, how the fact the judiciary was run, how the tax system was run. Uh, these were not issues uh, when we entered the European Union. However, the structures were highly politicized, highly um, centralized, highly opaque, 
on transparent, clientelistic, in a way which I believe at some point, we papered over by resources that were coming from the European Union uh, and then in the Eurozone, but when the crisis hit in 2008, these fault lines were revealed. Uh, I'll give you just a few examples because I think it's quite a stark difference from the experience you've had. I mentioned this earlier at the lunch we had before. Uh, I said to my um, colleagues when we uh, first met, uh, when I became Prime Minister, and they were very, of course, uh, astounded by the fact that uh, our statistics uh, were, um, uh, had, had changed and, and uh, that the deficit was double than the actual number that had been reported by the previous government. Uh, immediately they said, well, you have to cut, cut, cut uh, wages and pensions and so on. I said, well, that is part of the symptom and you can die from the symptoms. And we may, may need to do things, something there, but we really need to go down deeper and see why it ended up where Greece basically doubled its debt in five years and, uh, and its deficit so high. And I said the basic issues were structural um, of governance. So deeper reforms in governance will allow us to deal both with the deficit but also make our country much more transparent and, and uh, well-functioning. I said, for example, when I became prime minister, I asked for the number of civil servants that we had. Nobody could tell me. Nobody knew how many civil servants we had. I had to, uh, with uh, my ministers, be very imaginative, creative. We decided that um, no civil servant would get uh, their salary unless they registered online so we knew how many civil servants existed. Um, we uh, had, then we finally found out how many civil servants we had. We had a medical sector where we knew uh, that there was corruption. Uh, it was not, of course, just our doctors. It was the multinational pharmaceutical companies also involved with this that would uh, give kickbacks to our doctors if they over-prescribed treatments. And they did, many of them. And that was then billed to our public pension system. So our public pension system all of a sudden ballooned in costs over the past years. Uh, and uh, again, I decided that we'd use technology and uh, we put a software program for electronic prescriptions. The doctors reacted. They said they don't know how to use computers. I said, I will sever the contracts of doctors that don't know how to use computers in two weeks. 95% of the doctors learned how to use computers and we cut the cost by 50%. 2.5 billion, that's as much as we make in property taxes today in Greece. So that was the type of reform we needed. Um, I could add uh, the example of the tax system. Many people talk about tax evasion in Greece. That is a Greek problem, but of course it's a wider issue of tax havens, offshore companies, and so on. So it's a global issue. But uh, I will just make a distinction between Greece and Ireland. You have a very independent revenue service uh, which is non-politicized. In Greece, the Revenue Service has highly politicized, which meant that uh, the um, uh, political decisions and therefore uh, friends uh, of the government uh, could have special benefits by not paying certain taxes. Uh, others who may not be friends would be uh, found always something wrong with their tax um, credits, or and this was this would also be trickled down to even the some of the local tax services, where uh, unluckily a lot of craft, uh, and which created a, a very unjust tax system, but also one which is which people didn't trust. So we needed these types of reforms, uh, uh, and they, they were difficult ones. Again, we had to use our imagination. Uh, to find out what uh, certain properties were not being, were not being uh, reported. For example, we taxed swimming pools. Uh, people were not reporting their swimming pools, so we had to go on to uh, Google Earth to see where swimming pools were. Some people tried to cover them up with canvases and so on. So this was, a, this was a, a, some of the difficulties in reform. I want to compare it with Ireland. I'm not an expert on, on 
on, on Ireland, but uh, from my conversations, from my, my meager knowledge, I think what, what the difference between uh, your program and the way you dealt with it and ours had, were a number of things which I think were quite important. First of all, when you had the banking problem and you, had, you took on a, maybe an unfair burden as, as citizens uh, of paying the mis, mis, the demeanors of the, of the banking community. However, in the end, you said, well, let's get on with it. And there was a wider consensus in the political elite of your country. Uh, let's move on. Let's do what is necessary to get through with this. Uh, secondly, that did show not only a political consensus, but it created a sense of stability, uh, a sense of uh, credibility, a sense of continuity. And of course, the structures, your governance structures, um, <coughs> maybe one of the positive legacies of um, colonial rule. I know Cyprus compared to Greece, uh, there are very negative from the colonial rule, but that one possible positive is the uh, public administration, which we don't have in Greece compared to Cyprus. Um, and Ambassador of Cyprus is here. Uh, the, so you had this, these structures which made it much more credible. Um, so even though you have uh, the advantage of the tax structures, uh, which brings in foreign direct investment, I believe that that is not the only reason why your economy is, is moving forward. You have a much more um, organized public sector and, and, and a sense of stability, a sense of credibility, which is very important for the economy. Um, and in the European Union, when we had this program of adjustment, these types of issues were overlooked. It was sort of a blanket policy of an adjustment program without looking at some of the underlying causes of why we reached these difficult um, positions. Uh, secondly, uh, in Greece was the first country to um, have to deal with this sovereign debt issue. And truly, the European uh, institutions and members uh, were not, we were not familiar with how you, dealt, how you deal with a country which is possibly facing bankruptcy within a currency zone. So yes, there was a lack of knowledge, there was a lack of understanding, and many mistakes were made. Uh, amongst them was the sense that, well, this, you know, countries had to be punished for their bad behavior. So there was a bit of a moralistic uh, discussion about this. Um, and uh, talking with many of my American counterparts or finance ministers or former federal uh, heads of the Fed, uh, they often said, well, you know, if we were, if we were in the US, uh, we would not uh, put too much time around the, the moral problem. We would deal that at some point, but we would just save the day and we could do it in a few days or weeks. Uh, why are you dragging on so long? Um, the EU response, was uh, very, very uh, slow and, 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 and fearful, I would say. I say that because I think we have underestimated the uh, capacity that the European Union has if it wants to work in unison. Uh, I'll just give you one example. I remember I was in the presidency as foreign minister of the European Union in 2003. That was the time of the Iraq war, a very divisive time for the European Union, as you may remember. A split, um, and uh, and we had very big difficulties in coming up with common statements. But in any case, we got through it. Uh, a traditional meeting with the United States at the end of our presidency was in Washington. We met with President Bush, uh, Prime Minister Simitis was there of Greece, and I was there, of course, the Commission, um, and the first issue he put on the agenda was not the Iraq War and our relations, his relations with Europe. It was, are you going to change your policy on GMOs? Because we want to sell GMO products to Europe. So, um, well, whatever side you may take on the GMO issue, pro or against, uh, what it showed is what um, an academic called Anu Bradford, she's actually Finnish, calls the Brussels effect. The fact that when we have a unified policy, and we do have it in the single market, 
um, uh, people listen. People, people, we have influence around the world. And, uh, and that, was, that was a big issue. So issues on, whether it's on our markets, whether it's having to do with, uh, uh, you know, recently Microsoft or Google or whatever, or air pollution for airplanes and so on. These are issues where uh, when we have a united stance, this, uh, this, they, they, will, uh, they will listen to us. We didn't have this strong stance vis-a-vis -vis the markets at that time when it hit, when the sovereign debt crisis hit. The, um, uh, what, when I went to, to Angela Merkel very often as being the major player in this, uh, obviously, the, um, her stance was, uh, I'll use a German word, you must do your house aufgaben. You must do your homework, basically. And what she was saying is, you have to put your own house in order. And I said, yes, we do. There is a Greek problem. I said, obviously, it was an Irish problem, a different, a different character, maybe a Portuguese problem of a different character. But I said, there are flaws in the Eurozone, and there are also markets that are very risk averse. We have to show, you have to somehow, together, protect us uh, by these mar from these market fears and these, these risks. And this is what, the, uh, what the Europe could have done. Um, we underestimated, therefore, our potential. And uh, the sense of pooling uh, our strengths uh, was maybe seen by some in Europe as pooling risk. But when you do pool risk, you actually create a strength. That's what insurance companies do. We could have done that. That's what the credit union, the banking union, is supposed to do. Uh, and to prove my point, uh, both in 2009, early on, before the sovereign debt crisis, the spreads were going up in the periphery. Then uh, Finance Minister of Germany, Steinbrück, came out and said to the markets, don't worry, we're here, we will guarantee bonds, no, basically in so many words, and the spreads went down. In 2012, when it seemed that the euro was going to fall apart, Draghi came out and he said, we will do whatever it takes. We will actually buy bonds on the secondary market. He didn't need to buy bonds. He may have done so, but he, didn't. he just said that. Had Europe at the very initial stage come out and told the markets, don't worry, we're here. You know, they have a program. They have, they have and I had already begun a program in Greece of major changes before I had to access this mechanism. Had they done that, I think we would have been in a much better position and Europe would have avoided, and our countries such as Greece and Ireland possibly may not have needed to get into this bailout program. Um, I'll, add, I'll add another element to the problem I faced and Greece faced, and I think it's, it's, it's a lesson for us, but it's also, I think, uh, interesting to contrast with Ireland. Uh, the lack of consensus in Greece was very, very different. Uh, it was characteristically different than what you had in Ireland. I'm sure people bickered. I'm sure people had criticism in Ireland too. But uh, down deep, there was a sense that there was the major uh, uh, political uh, currents were saying, well, let's get through with this. We didn't have that in Greece. Um, as a matter of fact, there were um, many in the opposition, both on the right and the left, that cultivated in the public uh, a, a populism that, oh, we don't have to do anything. There were alternatives. We didn't, and, and, you know, this is all a conspiracy. Why don't you go to the Russians and have them buy the debt? You know, why don't the Chinese and so on, which I actually did. Uh, the Chinese bought uh, six billion. We needed something like 110 at that first bailout, so it wasn't, wasn't it was something, but uh, the Russians, when I talked to Putin, um, deferred me to, um, our bilateral discussions about uh, buying weapons. So it wasn't exactly what, um, what I had expected. Uh, the, uh, um, when I, what, uh, I reached the point when we came out, we needed the second bailout. Uh, and uh, the second bailout, I believe, we needed because the, there was a prediction that Greece would be coming out into the markets in 2012. The IMF realized we wouldn't be on the markets in 2012. Um, they were, uh, we had to re renegotiate a new bailout program. Uh, the blame was put more on Greece for that, but it was actually the Eurozone that was going into a, 
uh, a crisis at that time with contagion, with Italy and Spain possibly needing to access the mechanism. That's when Draghi came out, of course, too, a little bit later. But I decided that I needed a consensus. I needed a sense of ownership. I talked to the opposition. They didn't want any cooperation. <coughs> so I called up for a referendum. As Brendan said earlier, I, um, uh, I had a negative reaction from leaders in the European Union, which, of course, reverberated inside Greece and uh, ended up, I ended up at least creating a coalition which then uh, pushed the program further. But we lost a chance there to own the program and I think move forward for reforms more quickly and getting Greece out of this, out of this problem. Actually, the two opposition parties, both on the right and the left, the one now in, 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 in government, the Syriza or Tsipras, uh, Tsipras's party, both campaigned in elections on an anti-memorandum agenda and won the elections on an anti-memorandum agenda. Uh, the problem with that is that um, they didn't have much of, enough, much of else as a program. Uh, it was very easy to win elections on an anti-memorandum <coughs> agenda, but then if you don't have more of a program than you don't have much else to do, then simply to follow the memorandum. So in fact, uh, the reform dynamic that we had started, I think, needs to be rebooted, it needs to be restarted in Greece. And I do hope, uh, I've supported both governments because I support my country, and I hope this government will move forward to uh, deeper reforms rather than simply following a third and very difficult austerity program. After five years of austerity, we've lost 25% of GDP. We are number one uh, in OECD as far as fiscal um, adjustment uh, as ever in OECD's history, uh, with huge unemployment, youth unemployment up to 50%. We were uh, moving in, uh, into some slow growth. Uh, now we went back into recession, but hopefully if this government can create a sense of stability and, and, and move forward, uh, then we will get, regain confidence. But um, I just wanted to, before I, I conclude, talk a little bit about the European Union and what, this, uh, what some conclusions I would, um, I would come to. Well, first of all, uh, there were, it was easy to, to put the blame on the separate countries. So I, the Irish are to blame. Yes, we had our responsibilities. We Greeks, the Greeks are to blame, whatever. Maybe less the Spaniards. They were within the Maastricht Treaty, but they had a construction bubble. In any case, what happened was there was a narrative which developed, and I want to get to that because I think that's core and key to where, where Europe is today. The narrative that developed was not that this is a, a common problem we have to solve, but it was you know, the bad Greeks or the lazy Greeks. I saw that a number of times and I looked up statistics. We actually work more hours than any other European in, the, in, in OECD or in and the, amongst the OECD statistics have that. And, um, but there were other problems, of course. But this narrative was very easy. What it meant also that it said, it, said we, it was a convenient truth that allowed for others to say, we really don't need to make reforms in the Eurozone. We really don't need to make major changes. If each country does its, you know, its job, its homework, then everything will be fine. That's not true because, uh, first of all, we had, uh, Ireland was spared of this, but we had the continual rumors around Grexit, and not only rumors, but even real threats or preparation from some countries. Uh, you know what that means. If you feel you're going to lose your currency and go to another currency, you won't spend, you won't borrow, <coughs> banks won't lend, and foreign direct investment won't come uh, because they will just wait. That's what happened. So we had a paucity of economic activity, and that was a recurrent theme even recently. Um, that could have been stopped, but that was catastrophic. That could have been stopped at the European level. We could have cut that story, and, and, and that would have been much, much, more, um, much, much better. We had, of course, six years of lack of liquidity in banks, very slow progress in the, all these stress tests. Only recently uh, have we sort of gone through that. Um, there is a disparity in competitiveness within the Eurozone, uh, deflationary policies, uh, making our debt more difficult to, to service, 
Uh, very slow movement on the banking union. I do hope we do, do move to a gar credit guarantee. Uh, QE came, very important from Draghi, but something like seven years after the 2008 financial crisis, very, very late. So, and of course we have the disparities between surplus and deficit countries. These are some of the structural problems of the Eurozone, which if we do not uh, address, uh, will continue to, uh, to dog us, to, to bog us down, and, and we'll find them sooner or later again. Um, so, but what I want to say about the, uh, Europe did move ahead, of course. I can't, there is a, a question of whether the glass is half full or half empty. Europe did move ahead. We did create this mechanism. We did, uh, Draghi did move on in ECB. We are slowly moving to banking union. We're talking about more fiscal coordination and monitoring. Uh, so that is, has been positive. But the narrative still behind this became very much a, a national one, uh, a very much a stereotype, a stereotype between uh, the core and the periphery, the lazy and the austere, uh, uh, and from both sides, very, very negative. How can you create a union, a family, when you don't, when you start mistrusting each other at this level? And I think that has been fodder to populism, it's been fodder to a resurgent nationalism, in Europe, it's been fodder to uh, extreme groups, whether they're on the right or on the left. It's blended in with xenophobia and racism. Um, and that has just been fed by the refugee crisis, of course, uh, just been multiplied by the refugee crisis. So what I'm saying here is that um, um, Europe has, uh, has had an opportunity but it has also a, a huge challenge. To conclude, um, we are in a globalizing world. If I look at Ireland and compare it to Greece, I would say countries that have more stable, democratic, transparent, functioning structures are able to be more adaptable to the major changes we're facing in our globalizing economy. Uh, so that's, that's one conclusion. We need to get our act together in each country and help create the types of structures that will make our countries. You have countries in the, Nord the Nordic countries that are able to combine uh, social welfare on the one hand, uh, innovation on the other, and be very competitive, competitive in the global economy. Uh, but they're able to, do, to adapt, uh, and, and they do that through democratic means, through um, deliberation, through uh, consensus, and so on. These, I think, are what a functioning democracy is, and I think that is one very important point. However, the types of problems, the types of challenges we are facing cannot be, in the end, only through national policies. Uh, whether it's the financial crisis, which uh, I lived through, whether it is now the refugee crisis, which Greece is facing, uh, whether it is uh, climate change, of course, uh, or other similar types of problems, we need further cooperation. So at a time when we need more and more integration and cooperation. Unluckily, what we are seeing is a narrative in many of our societies of going back to the tribes, going back to our you know, huddling into closing down, putting our walls, closing our doors, thinking that the problems will stay outside if we, can, we, we build walls of one sort or another. Um, so I think we need to, to, to think of, of um, how the Eurozone is, moves ahead on issues like economic and fiscal coordination and integration, uh, mutualization of debt, the very um, controversial issue of the euro bond, but we need to open up these issues, tax policies, financial transaction taxes, as I said, the banking union. These are things that the Eurozone needs to move, and of course some form of governance of the euro Eurozone will have to be, have to be further uh, discussed. Um, I would also say that um, we need to revive what politics uh, should be and, and, and has been if we go back to the ancient times, ancient Greece. Um, uh, again, I'll come to Ireland. I would say that uh, what you've been able to do is, is create a sense of stability, but also innovation. You're both innovative. And I'm not talking about business. I'm not talking about science. I'm talking about politics. Uh, the idea of politics in ancient times was basically a revelation that no, we human beings don't have to accept our fate. 
we can actually change our fate. We can actually take our fate into our own hands and make something of it. We don't have to listen to tyrants. We don't have to listen to kings. We don't have to bow down to the high priests or magicians. We, as human beings, can actually change our fate. Well, when you have that, uh, then you start investing in people, you start investing in education, philosophy, games, athletics, and whatever, um, theater, arts, and um, democracy then becomes an innovation where, uh, on the one hand, uh, you humanize power so that you make sure that it's not usurped. Uh, the concentration of power was hubris for the ancient Greeks. And, uh, but also you allow for a creation of a trust, a collective trust to work together to be able to effect change. Now, that was politics. Politics was, and has, and should be, using imagination to innovate, to see how we can make our world better. Politics today is very much constrained. One of the reasons, there are many other reasons, but one of the reasons is that um, we are still national politicians, but the problems are more and more global. And, uh, and uh, so we need to see how, we, how democracy will move beyond borders. Uh, and uh, otherwise, people will start moving towards uh, a sense of, well, we, we're, we're helpless. We can't really solve these problems. Why aren't these politicians solving these problems? Why can't they? And, and we, aren't that, we aren't that powerful in this, in this global world as national politicians. Uh, but that frustration will somehow come out. Will it be a renationalization? Will it be populism? Will it be fundamentalism? Will it be a violence? Uh, will it be simply a passivity of passivity of our citizens? Um, well, the European Union, the European Union has the potential to be a different model in this globalizing world. That's what I want to conclude with. We are nations, different nations, different histories, even wars, and so on. But we have been able to create a sense of, 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 this is the basis of this, of common values going beyond uh, these national differences. And that's a seed of what possible regional or even global governments could look like. Um, and this, uh, I believe, goes to a concept which needs, needs more thought, is to think of um, the fact that we need a sense of what global citizenship whether you're a refugee from Syria or whether you are in Silicon Valley in Berkeley or outside here and near the airport where you have your big industries, there should be a sense that everybody has some basic rights around the world and, and basic protection. Um, but why don't we try doing that at the European level? Um, I throw out a few ideas which uh, have been talked about at different times, uh, as, which is democracy beyond borders. We've talked about unemployment, where there's been this idea of Erasmus for the unemployed. That would mean something like uh, a European voucher for the unemployed, where you wouldn't have a transfer economy from one country to another, but you would have actually a transfer from a central European bureaucracy to a citizen. Could be in Germany, could be in Greece, could be in Ireland, could be anywhere else. A youth who would then decide to go and study wherever for training to become employed again. Uh, why not the European asylum? We're talking about refugees. Uh, the idea that we should register each and every uh, person that comes through our borders and then see, of course, what he or she is, asylum seeker or migrant or need to be repatriated or whatever, but some kind of an idea and maybe in the future some sense of an integration with the European citizenship, not a Greek or an Irish or German citizenship, but maybe we should consider a European citizen. Maybe our migrants and refugees will, could become the first true European citizens. So uh, let's think of it in a very different way. Um, there has been a, bench, a lot of discussion about election of a president, direct election from our citizens. We need some kind of a symbolic sense of we have, that we have a European, and not a dominant one country or other country or something, but some European leader, woman or man, uh, uh, that has the, at least if not the power, at least the, the, the status the legitimacy of, of, of democratic, being democratically elected. Other ideas of European-wide referenda and so on. I say this because I think, again, if we want to bring politics back to our citizens and make the European Union a, Europe, a citizen project, we have to think in, a, in an innovative way, uh, we think somewhat out of the box. Final conclusion, Europe has been a peace project and it has been very, very, very successful uh, despite the difficulties of the recent years, Ukraine and so on. Um, 
but it has to rethink its mission statement. And I think from Peace Project, it has to be one of uh, humanizing globalization. I think, Rory, I remember you many years ago using this term of humanizing globalization as uh, we social democrats talked about humanizing capitalism. We need to be a humanizer of, uh, of globalization. We will face, as humanity, in a globalizing economy, an interdependent world, crisis after crisis, and sometimes very, very swift ones and very, very, uh, very, very difficult ones and complex ones. Europe, if it works together, can help adapt to the changes. It can help mitigate crises so that it slows down the crisis so that we have time as politicians, as democracies, to deal with them. Uh, and thirdly, also to lead change uh, around the world. We can actually lead, and that's what I would want to see Europe doing, in democratizing, equalizing, and sustaining, in a sustainable way, uh, the world. Um, maybe in Paris, again, despite its terrible wounds uh, these past few days, uh, in two weeks there is a uh, conference, a summit, global conference on climate change. Why not Europe being at the lead? Not simply about certain legislations, but invest in uh, a model, a vision for our younger generation of an alternative, sustainable economy where we not only stimulate our economy, but we train our youth in these new technologies, uh, we create the infrastructure, whether it's energy infrastructure, whether it's the grids, whether it's the uh, uh, tech technological and communications infrastructure, the alternative types of, 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 of transportation which are needed, which will make us a real single market, not someone simply on, on paper, but to create the necessary infrastructure so that we can be competitive and at the same time um, creating a new vision for Europe, but also leading in the world. So thank you very much.